guys, welcome back to our case of Econ Struggles. Welcome to another Micro Struggle. Today we're returning to the Edgeworth box with part two. In the last video on the Edgeworth box, I talked about just how to set up the Edgeworth box as well as how to look for Pareto optimality. And now we're gonna do that same thing, but we're gonna use non-standard preferences. So timestamps are below if you're looking for the Edgeworth box with a specific type of non-standard preference. Otherwise, what we're gonna do is that we're just going to go through each of those non-standard preferences. We're gonna draw the Edgeworth box. I'm not gonna start from scratch drawing the Edgeworth box. If you're looking for that video on first how to draw an Edgeworth box, you wanna see part one. Should be popping up in the top right just about now. So go ahead and save this video, go back to that part one, check it out, and then come back when you're ready. But basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna show the indifference curves. We're gonna identify the areas where utility is increasing for each person. We're gonna find areas of Pareto improvements, and then we're going to isolate and identify the Pareto optimal points on an Edgeworth box for each specific type of non-standard preferences. And by each type of non-standard preference, we're gonna talk about preferences in which there's one good and one neutral. We're gonna talk about perfect substitutes, and we're gonna talk about perfect complements. So again, timestamps are below. Let's go ahead and get into it with one good and one neutral. So like I said, we're gonna start with one good and one neutral. And so what we're going to say is we got Bill and Dave, and Bill has a utility function where he just likes X. Dave has a utility function where he just likes Y. The endowment, we're just going to make it easy and say 2, 2. So again, remember that if we're on this Edward box, then what we've got, if we've got 2 and 2, then we've got 4 goods total. So our number of X's are 4. So this may be 1, this is 2, this is 3, and that's 4. And again, on the y-axis, if we're looking at four, because we've got two and two, we've got one, two, three, and four. Remember, it's an Edgeworth box, because for every good that Bill has, Dave has less. So our endowment point of two, two is going to be right here, where again, this means that Dave has two going this way and two going this way, and Bill has two going this way and two going this way. And of course, this is where Bill has nothing and Dave has everything. This is where Dave has nothing and Bill has everything. So if Bill just likes X, let's think about Bill's indifference curves. Well, if he's got two, then basically he's just gonna have straight lines. And again, pretend that they're straight. He's gonna have two lines like this because Bill doesn't care how much Y he has. He only cares about how much X he has. For Dave, because he only cares about Y, then what we're gonna have is we're gonna have, again, supposed to be straight lines that look like this because Dave's utility gets better when he has more Ys. So Dave's utility is increasing in this direction, just like this, which means that Bill's indifference curves or Bill's utility is increasing as we go this way. So now I'm just gonna take out some of these indifference curves just to make it a little easier. It's got a lot of lines happening. So what I'm gonna do, I'm only gonna keep the indifference curves through the endowment. And so again, I've sort of got four boxes so maybe this is box A, this is box B, this is box C, and this is box D. And so now what I wanna do is I just wanna think about in which box are Bill and Dave getting happier or sadder. So this is gonna help me identify the areas of Pareto improvement. So if we think about Bill and we start in area D, we're gonna say, well, in this area D, Bill has more X's than he started with in his endowment, so Bill's getting happier. And that's gonna be the same thing for down here in C. And then, of course, in boxes A and B, Bill's going to have less X, so he's going to be sadder. So here's Bill being sadder, and now we can do the same thing for Dave. And so all we're looking for is the areas in which both people are happy. So in area D, Dave is sadder because he has less Ys, but if we go into area C, that is where Dave is having more Ys, so he's happy. Area B, Dave is also happier because he's getting more Ys, and he only cares about Y. And again, up here in part A, he is sad. So if we're thinking about where is the area of Pareto improvement, the area of Pareto improvement is going to be right here because both Bill and Dave are getting happier. So if it asks you, in, is the endowment a Pareto optimal allocation? It's not because Bill and Dave can both do better by being anywhere in area C. And so now we need to think about where is the Pareto optimal point. And normally with preferences, you would say, well, Aren't the origins Pareto optimal? Because it's generally optimal for Bill to have everything or Dave to have everything, because again, Pareto optimality. The only way for one person to become better is to make someone else worse. And that's not actually true here, and here's why. Suppose 
that we started where Dave has everything. So Dave has all the X's and all the Y's, but Dave doesn't care about X's at all. He only cares about Y's. So if you take X's away from Dave and give them to Bill, Bill is gonna get happier because Bill has more X's, and Dave's utility is unchanged because Y doesn't actually impact Bill's utility. So as we go this way along the axis, Dave's utility is staying exactly the same, but Bill's utility is getting higher. And so the Pareto optimal point is actually gonna be right here because that's the point at which Bill and Dave are happiest because again, Bill and Dave like different things. So if you're at any other point, you can always do better by giving Dave more Y's and giving Bill more X's. And again, because they're neutrals for the other person, taking away Y's from Bill, taking away X's from Dave, it's not gonna impact the utility. So this right here is the Pareto optimal point. And so that is again, for one good and one neutral. They're more complicated cases, of course. I chose an easy one where Bill and Dave like different goods. If you wanna see an example in which Bill and Dave like the same good, put that in a comment below. If there's enough demand for it, if there's enough likes on that comment, I'll make that video. Otherwise, hopefully this makes a little more intuitive sense about how this Edgeworth box works when one good and one neutral come into play. For our second sort of non-standard preferences, we're gonna talk about perfect substitutes. So again, we're going to have this two, two endowment just because it's kind of easy. So again, I'll sort of draw in that axis. We're gonna have our endowment right here. This is going to be at two, two, same setup as before. Now Bill and Dave have perfect substitutes where Bill's utility is three X plus Y and Dave's utility is X plus three Y. Notice that even though they both have perfect substitutes, Dave likes X more than Y and Dave likes Y more than X. So again, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna draw the indifference curves through the endowment. We're gonna identify the different areas on the Edgeworth box. And then we're going to identify the Pareto optimal points. Okay. So now if we start with Bill, he's got three X plus Y. So of course, if I transform that just to be a line, then if I say U bar is equal to three X plus Y, then of course that just means that Y is equal to U bar minus three X. And so we're going to have basically a negative three slope with a thing at U bar. And so of course what that's gonna mean, we're gonna go down three and over one so that's gonna mean that Bill's next point on the utility is gonna be one, two, three over one. And so it's gonna look something like this. It's gonna go through the Edgeworth box. Not gonna be to scale because I can't draw points, but you know, something like that. It's not crucial because I'm not gonna solve algebraically, but you sort of get the idea. And so for Dave, who's got X plus three Y, again, what that's gonna be, that's gonna be Y is going to be equal to negative one third X plus U bar over three. And so because this is upside down, it's actually gonna look similar to Bill, except it's not gonna be as steep. So you can imagine it's gonna look, I don't know, something like this, because it's gonna be flatter. And so that's going to be Dave's utility. And so again, let's just think about these different areas of the rectangle. If you're confused about how I draw these indifference curves, definitely put a comment below. But again, maybe we'll just go clockwise this time. So here's A, here's B, here's C, and here's D. And so I'm just gonna say this is Bill. And so if Bill is currently at pink dot and you put him in area A, that's giving Bill less X's and more Y's than what he had before. And so this is going to be worse for Bill because Bill's indifference curves are increasing in this direction. And so that's gonna make him sadder. Also, I just noticed this is reversed. This should be zero B and this should be zero D. Okay, so if I think about Dave in this same situation, Dave also has less stuff over here because he's moving back towards his origin. So Dave's sadder, so that's definitely not gonna be the area of Pareto improvement. If I go to area B, Bill's getting more stuff. Bill's pretty stoked about that. Dave is getting less stuff, so he's pretty bummed about that. Area C, this is nice because Bill is gonna say, well, in this area, I am actually getting more stuff. So that's pretty great for me. Dave is going to say, this is also great for me because I'm getting more stuff. And in area D, Bill is sad because Bill is getting less stuff. Dave is pretty stoked because Dave is getting more stuff. So even though they get perfect substitutes, again, 
that's sort of how that checks out. And so what we're gonna say is that the area of Pareto improvement is gonna be this blue sort of region right here because utility is increasing in this region C, so that's the area of Pareto improvement. Now, if we think about Pareto optimality, we are indeed going to have the same situation where Bill having everything or Dave having everything is going to be Pareto optimal because if you give Dave all the stuff, even though he values Y more than X, if you take away X from Dave, he's still gonna be worse off because it still impacts his utility. And so if you give it to Bill, you're gonna make Bill better off, but you're gonna make Dave worse off. And so if Dave has everything, there's no way to make Bill better off without making Dave worse. So it's Pareto optimal. Same story happens if Bill has everything. Now, in terms of the interior solutions, again, what's going to be true is that if you give Dave all of the Y's and you give Bill all of the X's, that's gonna be Pareto optimal for sure. And what you're gonna say is you're gonna say, well, what other points are gonna be Pareto optimal? Well, the points that are gonna be Pareto optimal are going to be if Dave has all the Y's, no matter what you do for Bill, then Dave will never want to give up Y's for X's because Dave just likes Y's more. So if you go like this, this line right here is Pareto optimal. Maybe I'll should do that in a different color. Maybe I'll do that in like red. So I'll do it in red. And so all of these points are Pareto optimal because any other point you're gonna have Dave give up Y's for X's and you're gonna make Dave worse because you can't compensate Dave enough to trade a Y for an X. And so the same thing is gonna be true for Bill if Bill has all the X's. You're not gonna be able to convince Bill you're not going to be able to trade Bill if Bill has all the X's. He's not going to want to trade because no matter what Y's you give him, it won't be as good as him holding all the X's. And so this is what you're going to have. So your Pareto optimal set is going to be the origin, and then it's going to be this line in red. So again, if this was confusing, please leave a comment below. Please ask a question. I'll try to get back to you. I'll try to make another video if it would be more helpful. Again, I'm sort of judging this based on demand. And so for our final type of non-standard preference, we're gonna use perfect complements. Again, I sort of reversed the zeros here. So I'm gonna change that back. This is gonna be zero Bill. This is gonna be zero Dave. And now we're gonna say that both people have the same preferences where they have a minimum of X and Y. So this is equivalent to being like left shoe, right shoe. So again, here's one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. And we're right here. So what's gonna happen is that for Bill, Bill needs to have one and one. So if we've got two and two, then he's gonna look like this. So his indifference curve comes down like an L shape, like I've talked about in some of my other videos. And Dave similarly is going to have this right here. So this is what this is going to look like. And now of course, we still have our four areas. We have A, we have B, we have C, and we have D. We start in area A. Bill's happier because he has more pairs of shoes. Over here, Bill is going to be less happy because he basically has less pairs of shoes. In area C, he's going to be less happy because Bill has less pair of shoes. And over in area D, Bill is also less happy because he has fewer pairs of shoes. Area A, Dave is sad over here. Dave is also going to be sad. Over here, Dave is going to be happy because he has more pairs of shoes. His utility is increasing in this direction. Bill's utility is increasing in this direction. And so over here, Dave is gonna be sad. So you can see that there is no situation in which we have a Pareto improvement. And so what we're gonna say is again, if we're asked, is this allocation Pareto optimal? It actually is. This is actually Pareto optimal because there is no Pareto improvement that we can find on this Edgeworth box. So if you're thinking about the Pareto optimal set, again, it's gonna be the two zeros and it's going to be the endowment. So if this was helpful, if this is helping you better understand an Edgeworth box, please comment that below. Please like this video, please subscribe if these videos are helping you out in general. If you're still confused, if there's something you wanna see related to an Edgeworth box, also put that in the comment section below. We'll see you next time for another case of Econ Struggles.